Hello, welcome to our webinar and thank you for joining today's presentation of Infinera Insights Coherent Optics Unplugged. During today's event, please submit any questions you have using the Q&A tab and our panel may be able to answer them after the presentation concludes. A recorded version of this webinar will be posted to the investor page of Infinera's website early next week, along with a copy of the slide deck. Now I'd like to introduce Amitabh Posse to welcome you and to introduce today's presenters. Thank you, Jillian. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And thanks for joining us today. As Jillian mentioned, my name is Amitabh Posse, Head of Investor Relations at Infinera. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the second Infinera Insights webinar. As a reminder, the Infinera Insights webinar series is an educational series designed to help you better understand key market and technology trends underpinning the transformation of high-speed optical networks. Our conversation today will focus on the importance of advanced coherent optics technology as optical transmission networks evolve to support ever-increasing bandwidth growth and new applications. Our featured speaker is Parthi Kandapan, Infinera CTO, though we will have Rob Shore, our Senior VP of Marketing, make a few opening comments. Supporting Parthi during the Q&A portion of the conversation today will be Nancy Erba, our Chief Financial Officer, Glenn Laxdell, our Head of Product Management, myself, and Rob and Bill for marketing. Before we jump in and get started, I do want to go over a few housekeeping items. After Parthi's formal presentation, we will save some time for Q&A. As Jillian mentioned, please submit your questions in the Q&A box during the presentation, and we'll try to address as many of them as we can today. We've allotted about 60 minutes for the entire session today. Third, and very importantly, we are in our quiet period, and therefore the focus of our conversation today will be on market trends, architectural shifts, and technology capabilities. There'll be no financial update, nor any specific discussion on our strategic programs and our product roadmaps. Please be mindful of these constraints when we get to the Q&A portion of the conversation today. And finally, this presentation contains forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties as detailed in our safe harbor statement contained in today's presentation materials. Infinera assumes no obligation to, and does not currently intend to, update any such forward-looking statements. With that, I'll hand over the call to Rob and Parthi to delve into coherent optics. Thanks, Amitabh. So real quick, I just wanted to run everybody through kind of the objectives of this uh, session and what we plan to cover and, and what we hope to get out of it. So the first uh, is just a bit, little bit of a better understanding of what is coherent optics, how it differs from other optical technologies, uh, and the growing importance of coherence uh, across the industry. Uh, obviously, coherent has been used heavily in core networks, uh, and what we're seeing as Parthi will go through is how that technology is now uh, migrating and permeating more parts of the network, even all the way to the edge. Uh, so in addition to looking at what is coherent, we'll take a look at some of the market projections for coherent technology. Then what we wanted to do is get in and kind of unbundle what we find is a lot of confusion behind the different variations of coherent engines, um, both uh, in the different delivery vehicles, whether it's a pluggable delivery vehicle or an embedded delivery vehicle, uh, and what some of the different applications are and how different technologies uh, apply and, and benefit different types of applications. And then we'll take a look at the market projections for the different technologies in those different applications. And we'll see there's really a, a very prominent role for both embedded and pluggable technology uh, for coherent optics. And finally, what we'll do is take a look at what it takes to build a coherent optical engine, some of the core competencies uh, and key enabling technologies uh, that enable people to, to uh, develop and produce these types of technologies, how one differentiates themselves in, in developing these, uh, and really a focus on the value of vertical integration and how that helps uh, vendors create better technology and be more competitive and differentiate. So those are the topics we're going to cover. And with that, I will uh, hand it over to Parthi, who's going to take us through all of this subject matter. Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> uh, good day, everyone. Uh, let's let's uh, dive in. Uh, we will talk through, as Rob said, uh, three key areas. One, why coherent? Uh, what is coherent? Uh, what form factors coherent comes in? And what does it take to achieve uh, high performance, low cost in coherent? Now, I'd like to start by recalling that in services, uh, in, in, in networks, every service that we provide to our customers, whether it is commercial uh, customers or whether it is personal customers, whether it is 5G, irrespective of the topology, the distance, and the type of service, 
they all require transport. This transport network invariably today is an optical network. And so if you look at optical networks and try to understand what constitutes an optical network, there are essentially two key pieces to an optical network. Uh, if I can use the analogy of a roadway system, the optical network consists of an optical layer or typically what we call a line system, which is the equivalent of a road. And we have transponders, which is the equivalent of vehicles. For a long time, these were all bundled and provided. So you bought the road and the vehicles together. Uh, and these were called the integrated systems. But we have slowly evolved to a disaggregated uh, solution space where the optical layer and the transponders are essentially considered two different elements. And it makes eminent sense. The optical layer, which is typically a fiber plant with amplifiers so on, is something that you invest over multiple generations of the transponders, but the transponders are changing at a much larger space, a much faster space. You will also notice as we go through this, that it's not a one size fits all when it comes to transponders, but the optical layer is capable of accommodating many different types of vehicles. The key point that I would like everybody to take away is that in an optical engine, 70% of the cost of a transponder is built into the optical engine. So when you buy a transponder, you are buying essentially an optical engine with some surrounding packaging that makes it usable. So let's dig a little deeper into what an optical engine uh, and how optical engines are made. There are two types of optical engines. For a long time, we used to use direct detect. It still is used for lower rates and shorter reaches. But as the baud rates went up, as the throughputs went up, and we needed to drive these over longer distances, we invented coherent technology. So industry has been providing coherent technology for just under a decade at this point in time. What drove the need for coherent technology is the fact that it could provide a much higher capacity, so higher baud rates, higher modulation formats that bring a higher capacity per, per laser, but it also allowed for a much higher capacity per fiber. And so we have today a coherent technology that is increasingly important for distance and capacity. And you will hear me refer to this, what I call the reach capacity matrix. But coherent technology is significantly complex. It does provide orders of magnitude increase in value, but the complexity of bringing it to production limits it to a small number of players in the market today. Now, coherent technology started off with high capacity, long haul. Uh, primarily, it started with a subsea. Today, if you look at coherent technology, it has expanded significantly, and we are at the cusp of driving it down to the axis. And that leads to a significant growth of the coherent optics market. Now remember, optical engines are not only coherent, but coherent is becoming an increasingly large part of the total optical market, a significantly large part. So let's take a look now at the parts of an optical engine. Remember, we talked about a transport network, a line system and transponders. Transponders are primarily made of optical engines. And now let's take a look at what these optical engines are made of. There are two primary constituents of an optical engine. The optical front end, which is all the lasers, the receiver, the pin diodes and so on. And as we got to coherent, the digital signal processing which, which is the brain of the entire system. Now, if you take a look at that 70% of the bomb of a transponder that we talked about, 
70% of that bomb is roughly in the optical front end. And digital signal processors are roughly in the 10 to 15%. The key point to note though is, without the brain, you don't have a functioning optical engine. And so while the cost component of the digital signal processor is a smaller portion of the total bomb of an optical engine, it constitutes the most complex part of bringing it together. Now you can take these two engine, the in, uh, components of an engine and package them in many different ways. Originally, because of the complexity of coherent engines, they started off as purely embedded engines. But as we get more familiar with driving DSPs as the need for coherent into uh, the edge of the network becomes more pressing, we've started packaging them in pluggable form factors. And we'll go through the difference between embedded and pluggable and the application scenarios for those. Now, I've said this, uh, I, I've made it look simple to take an optical front end and a digital processor and package it together. Please realize that there was a reason we all ran away from ACOs and DSPs separately and went into a DCO because the art of packaging them is significantly complex in and of itself. Therefore, to realize a true high performance, low cost optical engine, you need a plethora of key underlying technologies. And at Infinera, at the Optical Innovation Center, we have over the last two decades assembled a core set of competencies that allow us to serve this entire market. Now let, let's take a look at what the, the fundamental technologies that allowed us to go into these different directions. We've been driving Moore's law, and even though we are talking about optical networks, it's still relevant for us because the digital signal processor is essentially a CMOS device. We have moved from 28 nanometer, today we are at seven nanometer and at the cusp of introducing five nanometer and three nanometer technologies. That allows us an enormous amount of capacity and functionality to be compressed into smaller and smaller form factors, giving us within the same footprint, a, multi, a many orders of magnitude increase in performance and capacity. Now the same thing is applicable, though I have not called it out here, on the optical front end also. Uh, you may recall that almost a decade ago, we had a 100 gigabit op coherent optical engine front end. Our PIC, the photonic integrated circuit that we introduced today, uh, or introduced now called I6, has roughly the same footprint. So both the optical front end and the digital signal processor have managed to squeeze in a ton of functionality within roughly the same footprint. But we can package them in different formats. So as we get to pluggables, we need smaller footprint, lower power, so on. So we package roughly a billion and a half transistors for a ZR plus E colon. But the I6, which is an embedded high performance, high capacity, uses four to five times the total number of transistors. And therein lies the uh, difference between pluggable and embedded. You are able to take the same CMOS processor node, the same optical picks, but package different functionalities so you can get a different size and power. And therefore you get two different solutions pluggable and embedded. Now let's take a look at where these form factors come up with. There is a plethora of form factors, start everything from SFP to sleds. And if I can use the same uh, vehicle analogy, you have everything from scooters to trucks. Now, no one size solves all problems and no one single optical engine 
is viable for all applications. What the analogy I typically talk to people is Amazon uses a small blue truck to deliver goods to your house, but that doesn't mean they got rid of all their large trucks. In fact, as the number of small blue trucks increases, the number of big trucks that carry those to the distribution center increases. And you will see this in later slides where we see that as the pluggable form factors grow, the embedded form, uh, form factor applications also grow. So we have different form factors, QSFP DD, CFP2, and SLETS. If you look at the lower end of this diagram, you will see that we call out the different applications. When you're looking for short reach, you don't need a whole lot of performance. You are driven more by cost and power. But as you go to the higher end of the solution, you start feeding in a lot more functionality and that drives these different form factors. So you ask yourself, what engine is appropriate for what application? Clearly in the low end pluggables, 40 to 100 kilometers, ZR, and I want to make the distinction here between ZR and ZR plus, ZR is clearly the right solution for uh, roughly under uh, 80 kilometers. But as you go to metro applications, now we are moving from 80 to 1000 kilometers. The networks become more complex. You have more optical engines. The road becomes more complex in a sense. So high end ZR plus pluggables become the right solution. But as these networks, as Metro goes from Metro access all the way to Metro core to Metro regional, and then you get into regional and long haul networks, the distance increases, you want to get higher capacities on these things. So embedded takes over. So between pluggables and embedded, there's a significant overlap, but it all depends on the application you want to drive. There could be Metro applications or a metro solution ZR plus that bleed a little bit into long haul when you're not worried of, when the network is less complex and you're not worried about too much capacity. Similarly, high end embedded solutions become very viable when you get into very high capacity metro networks. So you have to keep this in mind as you look at the application and which solution you pick for your particular application. Now, pluggables is not new. For the last two decades, uh, we have been selling transport platforms and these transport platforms have always had both embedded and pluggables. In fact, the very first platform that Infineer sold had XFP pluggables and our own DWDM embedded engines. We have now over the last few years driven more towards compact modeler and the prime reason for compact modular transport platforms is to eliminate all the fancy bells and whistles and make it a very efficient, effective, cost-effective, dedicated transport platform. Now within this transport platform, you can plug in any solution, whether that's pluggables or embedded. Each of them go into a line cut or a sled and the sleds could be carrying an embedded solution or a pluggable solution. And we'll see later on that the transport platform is the ideal solution because it gives you the flexibility of choosing pluggables or embedded, but at the same time, give you the, giving you the right cost point. As I said, pluggables and embedded constitute the totality of the solution. And as the access networks, 5G and uh, remote 5, so on, pick off and cable uh, modems pick off, and there's a lot of capacity going into the edge of the network, pluggables become a very viable solution. They increase the market in that segment while they continue to drive the embedded market. And as I said, the more number of small blue trucks that Amazon uses to deliver to your house, 
the number of trucks that are going to carry goods to their fulfillment centers is also going to increase. So you will notice in this, in this slide, the cap, if you look at the capex and ports, the embedded capex or the, the total cost of embedded is slightly higher than pluggables. But if you look at the number of ports, the ports are going to be higher on pluggables. That's because pluggables are cheaper, lower cost. So you sell, you ship a lot more of the pluggables, but the total revenue is skewed in favor of embedded. Both of them are necessary for the right solution. Now, one of the trends that we see happening is that in the pluggable market, and as I said, pluggables are not new. We have had even high-end uh, uh, optical engines as pluggables, but you are seeing a standardization towards a 400 gig ZR for smaller distances and a 400 gig ZR plus for met metro and longer distances. So roughly, if you look at a break around 400 gig for the pluggables, and the embedded is was driving at 600, and today we have all started shipping 800 gig. Now you'll notice something significant here. We call this the technology node. 400 and 800 does not mean everything is running at 400 and 800. And we will talk about this in a couple of upcoming slides. The maximum capacity of the technology is 400 and on the embedded 800. And in a few years, we will see 800 gig ZR plus and 1.2 and 1.6 uh, embedded solutions. Now, a question that uh, we are asked often is, does, is embedded going to take over? And is embedded going to go directly into switches and routers? Let's take a look at some of the underlying drivers. As we showed in the previous few slides, pluggables and embedded are complementary parts of a solution. And the reason for that is Pluggables have different functions. Pluggables have different form factors, lower footprint and a lower power. But that also limits the distances and the capacities you can drive. Remember, I talked about reach capacity matrix. Please keep that in mind. When somebody says 400 gig they, or 800 gig, the immediate question we should ask ourselves is, 400 gig to what distance? 800 gig to what distance? Because there is a big difference if an 800 gig engine or a 400 gig pluggable can go distance X, 100 kilometers or 400 kilometers, roughly in the case of ZR plus. And then when you want to get to 1500 kilometers and 2000 kilometers, you have to start dropping the throughput through the dock. So 400 gig technologies of ZR plus have a, a capability to drive different distances. Now, if you drive them directly into a router or uh, a switch, you are making a trade-off on trying to reduce the, eliminate the cost of a transport platform at the cost of in reducing the density of a router. Now we talked about compact modular transport platforms earlier. And the reason we wanted to highlight that was to show that a transport platform is a very low cost, essentially a carrier of an embedded or a pluggable optical engine. So if you take the optical engine out of a transport platform and try to put it into a router, you are eliminating a small piece of the bomb, essentially the sheet metal carrier, some controller cards, but you are transferring all of that complexity to a router. And if you look on the left-hand side, a ZR plus that goes 300 to 400 kilometers is a 20 watt device, goes into a QSFP DD. But a ZR plus that tries to drive 1000 kilometers is a 35 watt CFP2. So you have to make a choice in your router, whether you want to put a QSFP DD plug or a CFP2. The moment you put a CFP2, you've reduced the density of a router. Now realize what you've done here. You have traded off 
the cost of a transport platform, the sheet metal, so on, on a compact modeler with this controller cards, but you have reduced the density of a router. Now this becomes exacerbated even more when you realize that a ZR Plus drives roughly 400 kilometers, 400 to 600 kilometers in a CFP2. But if you want to go to 1500 kilometers or 2000 kilometers, you start dropping down into proprietary modes. So you've lost interoperability, or plug and play between different vendors. You've reduced the density on the router. You have taken a router that could run 400 gigabits and you are stranding some of the router capacity. So yes, theoretically you could plug in a ZR plus into a router, but for a lot of variety of reasons, you're much better off plugging into a transport platform. Now, uh, one additional point that I would like to point out is, as you look at ZR plus, as you look at pluggables, we talked about the fact that functionality is being reduced. So everything from encryption to protection switching, so on, that is available in transport platforms, that's available in embedded platforms, is not supported in ZR plus type solutions. So now you have to solve them somewhere else. So again, you're beginning to burden the router. And as these switches, switch chips become higher capacity in density, people are looking at co-packaged optics. Once co-packaged optics becomes reality, you will notice that for short distances, maybe up to two kilometers intra data center, you don't need any pluggable for the switch or router. So by definition, as CPO becomes viable, you are going to have to move back to transport platforms to be able to go longer distances. So it's our very strong belief that transport platforms provide the right solution and they allow you to make the right choice between pluggables and embedded depending on the application and the reach capacity matrix that you're trying to hit. Now, let's take a look at why, uh, how optical engines are made and why vertical integration is needed. Now we talked about the optical front end and a digital signal processor and how they are packaged together. We also recall that earlier on, our first attempts in the industry was to go with an ACO and a DSP, but we very quickly realized the complexity of packaging those, the analog experience between an ACO and a DSP wasn't good enough. But there are also additional reasons. By pulling these together, you reduce the total cost. You also drive the performance much higher. Now, you take a different, whether you look at ZR plus pluggables or you look at 800 gate embedded engines, the difference between those engines going a few hundred kilometers versus a thousand kilometers is something that's not shown in the picture and that's represented by the plus sign. Tying together the optical front end and the digital signal processor is a whole of a whole lot of RF electronics. And that is what we call the implementation penalty. Driving that implementation penalty leads to a very high performance. So to get a lower cost without the margin stacking of buying the optical front end and the digital signal processing from different people, putting them together, so you eliminate margin stacking, and by doing the design, we are able to do the budgeting of the performance between these two engines and the in, uh, underlying interconnects to enable the best performance possible. Now you tie those two together with a whole lot of innovation and you bring down the total cost of the network. So in summary, the market for coherent optics is increasing significantly as both coherent drives towards the edge and the need for capacity at the edge is increasing significantly. There is a role for both pluggables and embedded solutions. And it, it's our strong belief that as pluggables drive the volumes at the edge of the network, embedded is going to significantly increase 
to underlie and support the pluggables uh, in the shorter distances. And these are best served in a transport platform. And we bring the best solutions to market at the lowest cost point through a vertical integration. And as these complexities increase, you will continue to find fewer and fewer capable vendors. Where we had a dozen vendors playing in the embedded market, we are effectively down to two or three. So all of this puts us in a very exciting position of being able to support the exploding capacity with increasing solutions that are complementary to each other at the lowest cost point. And so Infinera has been at this for the last two decades. We have driven a significant number of innovations. We have a deep coherent expertise. We are able to bring the lowest cost and the highest performance because of our vertical integration. These capabilities are equally amenable to being driven into embedded and pluggable solutions. And we intend to continue to drive this market with high capacity, appropriate solutions at the right cost point. So with that, I'll hand back to Amitabh. Thanks, Marty. Uh, that was great, very informative. And we do have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, normally this is not a, sh a shy crowd, so I'm sure we'll get more questions coming in. So uh, again, everyone, just as a reminder, um, because we're in a quiet period, we just have to uh, you know, be careful how we respond to some of these questions. So let me start with the first one part. The, the question is, Infinera has decided not to invest in standalone ZR outside of leveraging merchant components. Do you see enough differentiation in ZR plus to invest in customer solution? Again, uh, I don't think we can get into specifics, but maybe partly if you can approach this just generically, how we contemplate trade-offs when we think about just investments in R&D projects and make it more generic in sure. general. Sure, definitely. Um, as, as I uh, alluded to in the presentation, uh, we have the capacity, the optical engines, we can do DSPs. If we do high-end DSPs, we can always do low-end DSPs. We have uh, engines, everything from 100, gigabot, uh, 100 gigabit to today 1.2 uh, gigabit and higher that we are all driving to. Uh, and all these technologies are completely uh, transferable from one end to the other. So it's just a question of what we intend to bring to market at what point in time. And that I presume given the quiet period, uh, we have to be cautious. Uh, the next question, what is your estimate of the cost per bit difference between an embedded slash systems-based 400 gig short reach DCI port and a 400 ZR module? Suppliers, and I'm assuming these are pluggable suppliers, talk about a 75% plus cost reduction, suggesting about 20K for system level versus a 5K 400 ZR ASP. Uh, so maybe the first question is if we have any sense or notion of the cost per bit difference, it seems like between embedded and ZR type pluggables. Can I, let me just, R yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to, I wanted to make a comment to that. I, I honestly think that that type of analysis is, is a bit myopic and it's missing the bigger picture because the, the only cost in a network, uh, you know, optics is not the only cost in a network. Uh, Parthi talked about this before, but there's a huge cost in the road itself and the optical infrastructure, depending on where you are in the network. When you're at the very edge of the network, the road is cheap. It's just a fiber between two locations. Maybe there's an amplifier, but it's just a fiber. That's a relatively low cost road. So the value of that road is low. And therefore the equation then becomes about the cost per bit of the transceiver itself. When you start going into the longer haul, even regional, certainly long haul and obviously sub C, the investment in the road is extensive. You think about a submarine cable, an Atlantic submarine cable could be $600 million and take five years to build. Now you've got an extremely expensive road and you wanna maximize the efficiency you get out of that road. You wanna pack every single bit you possibly can. Now the value of the vehicle isn't saving a couple dollars on a cost per bit on the transceiver, 
the value of the transceiver and the optical engine is on which engine is going to enable me to leverage that $600 million investment most effectively and delay the need to build another $600 million fiber cable. So the real question here is not cost per bit on a transceiver, but it's which optical solution provides the greatest value for your network, the lowest total cost of ownership, and enables new types of features. So there will always be a cost difference between a pluggable and an embedded, but they're trying to solve different problems. The embedded technology is really trying to ensure you're getting the most investment or the most return on your investment for the road, for your infrastructure, that you can pack the most amount of capacity on individual fiber, that you can you know, build 600 or 800 gig trucks and fill them all the way up and get them across the entire network that you need to get to. So I think any when you ask that question, when that type of question gets asked, it's missing the bigger picture on total cost of ownership and overall value for the network. Yeah, and, and if you look at the, the, the technology and, and you know, build, building on top of Rob's solution, um, uh, I, I like that, uh, you know, uh, the phrase that I used, you know, the reach capacity matrix, it's very important, right? Uh, do you want to buy a, 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 a very cheap uh, Nissan Leaf? Might be good enough if all you want to do is to run around the town. But if you want to go 300 kilometers, you go pay a much higher cost for a Tesla. Uh, and as, as, I, as I said, uh, the 400 gig ZR uh, might give the impression that there's a lower cost, but you are now hiding the capacity. So if you want to go 400 gig ZR plus that goes 400 kilometers to carry 800 gig of traffic that I needed just two engines on either end and I could go thousand kilometers, you have to put a router every 400 kilometers. You have to put some encryption engines somewhere else. You have to put protection switching somewhere else. So you have transferred the cost uh, so if you look at the, the right answer, the right way to look at it is the reach capacity matrix. So yes, that it is absolutely true. And I, as I acknowledged earlier, you will not buy a big uh, rig to run between your houses and deliver traffic. You will buy a small blue van. But if you really want to carry the traffic between your distribution centers, you don't pack that into a thousand vans and send them to different distribution centers. So when we look at the cost reduction, you have to be careful. Second, people would say uh, 400 gig ZR plus reduces the cost. But then the moment you ask them, okay, how do I go uh, 1,200, 1,500 kilometers? They say, oh, drop down to 200 gigabits and go QPSK. Well, you dropped your capacity down by half. And there is an implicit cost there. So if you're trying to go shorter distances and your total capacity is lower, on the, on the fiber itself? Absolutely, that is the right solution for the pluggables. If you want to go longer distances, maximize the capacity on the fiber and get the total cost, you absolutely go for this. Uh, go, go, go for an embedded uh, solution. So the cost differential of $6,000 for a ZR plus versus 20,000 or so for a transport, a, a, a high-end engine uh, is not apples to apples comparison. You should really look at what is the reach capacity? How many gigabits am I carrying over how many kilometers? The moment you start looking that, you get a real picture. Uh, you know, we'll stay on this topic as I see a few other questions on this topic, actually quite a few. So uh, I think this one's an interesting one. Given the responses that we heard from Rob and Parthi, when you give this response to, or, or when customers are considering their strategic deployment alternatives, what is the primary pushback or counter argument? In other words, if a customer would suggest that they, are, they see the world differently with regard to pluggables or 800 gig or whatever, what would be the basis of their argument? I, I would say, I mean, uh, probably Glenn, Glenn should approach this, but uh, I, I would say the first and foremost is what application they are trying to solve, right? If they are trying to solve a metro core or, or a metro access application, absolutely, it's very understandable why they want to go into a lower end. But if they are looking for very high capacity, uh, realize this, people are looking at C plus L. Now they are talking about super C. Why is it that? Because as Rob pointed out, they want to maximize that road. They are trying to drive higher and higher capacity. So if you are a customer who's worried 
about running out of capacity on the fiber. If you are a customer who is worried that you cannot draw a new fiber between these two cities across the continent and you want to maximize capacity, you are by definition going to look for a different solution. However, if you are a customer that's serving a metro area and you are looking for smaller capacities between a large number of points, it's absolutely understandable why they would go into pluggable. So we have not run into customers who take a rigid stance and say, I'll only go one way or the other. Uh, they look at what the application is. And in fact, I would say, we haven't addressed one other problem and that's called the operational experience. Customers worry about getting a pluggable that takes them only 400, 600 kilometers. And when they need to go higher distances, they have to put embedded. Does this solve my entire network? So you really have to look at the application. And I, and I, would, I would agree that if a customer has a very small area that he wants to cover, perfect. He will use pluggables. Can I, I just and, and by make... the way, we are not, uh, we don't have a religion about embedded versus pluggables. We will provide both solutions at the right uh, metric for the customers. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to that point, and maybe Glenn, you can chime in. I, I get the sense talking to people a lot of times that they feel like coherent pluggables is new, like 400 gig ZR is the first time we're seeing coherent technology in a pluggable form factor. The reality is, is we've had coherent and pluggable form factors for seven, eight years already. Uh, and we deploy a ton of them. Uh, a lot of our platforms leverage those coherent pluggables and have for seven or eight years. It's a very large portion of our business. So this decision in these conversations about where pluggables make sense, where embedded makes sense, these are not new conversations that we have with our customers. The, uh, virtually all customers have some need for embedded and some need for pluggable. And depending on their application, their network topology, their drivers, um, that line just shifts back and forth, uh, again, customer by customer. But you can see the vast majority of 200 gig coherent technology today is sold in embedded uh, and pluggable form factor. And, and as Glenn can attest to here, we do a huge amount of business on, on uh, coherent pluggables and a big amount of business on embedded, right? So again, this is not a new question, not a new, uh, not a new type of technology. The only difference now is that instead of 200 gig based pluggables, we now are moving into 400 gig based pluggables. And instead of 400 gig embedded, we're moving to 800 gig embedded. So same conversation, just shifts the technology. Uh, Glenn, do you have any? No, I mean, I've got nothing to add. I think uh, Parthi and, and Rob pretty much nailed that question. Uh, I want to follow up on, again, sorry, the same point, just because I think it's a very pertinent question. I think there also seems to be this confusion that, hey, the points Parthi, you and Rob are making with respect to this embedded versus pluggable conversation, embedded suited for ultra long haul submarine. And the big question is, hey, what happens in that metro space? And I think quite often metro is treated as one kind of monolithic entity. So maybe if you can parse, and, and the reason this is a very important question is because metro is almost half the optical market, right? So five, six billion. So maybe if you can help dissect that piece and rightfully so, one of the questioners asked that, you know, they believe that's kind of the key battleground particularly around this conversation and better versus pluggable. So maybe peel that for us a little more and how you look at this metro segment of the market. Yeah, I, I, I will talk about the engineering and the technology and, and Rob and Glenn can perhaps address the uh, business and market side of it. Uh, now, first of all, realize we should look at this um, as two different. There is pluggables going into switches and routers and then pluggables going into transport. We strongly believe for all the reasons I articulated that pluggables in transport platforms are going to be the predominant solution. Uh, and we have engineered our compact model at platforms to equally serve pluggable and uh, embedded. That's, we, we really don't have any religion whether you want to buy an embedded sled or a pluggable sled. And as I told you, the biggest cost is in the optical engine, so it really doesn't matter. So the first point is pluggables going into transport platforms doesn't make a difference to us because we will serve the pluggable business and we will serve it in a transport, uh, transport market. Pluggables and embedded are, as I said, again, complementary solutions. And where you really want very high capacity, really high capacity, uh, 
if if you start look if you if you take a look at where technology is driving people are trying to drive to uh, super c band why because they want very high capacity in the fibers and if you ask google fiber they will tell you how easy or not so easy it is to draw fiber in cities so there is a complexity on on drawing fiber so you want to maximize the capacity on the fiber second there is a perception that metro is a simple network you have to make a distinction metro is is maybe a large market but it's also a significantly fragmented market in terms of applications and that's why we say metro access metro core metro regional as you get to metro core and metro regional the network it's of the roads are more complex you got multiple rodams pluggables are necessarily engineered for being high performance on very complex line systems so if you are looking for both high capacity and you are looking for complex metro networks with a lot of rodams and so on the losses on zr and zr plus are not able to keep up with the capacity and so we believe that for those reasons metro solutions are going to be leveraging both pluggables and embedded solutions and and we've seen this in real applications Yeah, just to add to that. I mean, you look at the markets today. Metro is already dominated by pluggables, right? I mean, uh, high-end pluggable current 200 gig CFP twos uh, have been a bulk of the metro markets already. So I don't think ZR and 400 gig. That's not going to change that. If they're already largely pluggables, there are still a pretty solid number of applications in a metro, as Parthi just mentioned, uh, where spectral efficiency or the amount of capacity you can get on a fiber uh, becomes the driving factor. right if you don't have a lot of fibers or if that's an expensive fiber plant to put in you're going to do everything you possibly can to get as much capacity on that fiber as you can and full stop embedded will always give you better spectral efficiency and embedded technology will always enable network operators to get more capacity on a on an individual fiber so if that's your driving criteria your driving uh, factor embedded is always going to be the right solution for you because it will enable you to pack more on every fiber uh in some metro networks fiber density and and capacity per fiber isn't the driving factor in which case pluggables take over but i do want to make a point right because we use this broad definition of the word pluggable and not all pluggables are created equal um obviously embedded always gives you better performance better spectral efficiency uh more reach performance uh, as parthi talked about as soon as i go into a pluggable it's going to go down even going from embedded to a cfp2 um the performance will go down and you're going to get less out of it but even there's a big distinction between a cfp2 which almost universally will go into transport platforms the size power requirements a cfp2s will almost 100% have always and will always go into uh transport platforms when you take and get another step down to do a qsfp dd into that smaller form factor not only are you sacrificing even more performance uh but you're also having to remove functionality Uh, so things like tunable filters, micro amplifiers, uh, as Parthi mentioned, encryption, things like that, they don't fit into that smaller form factor. So just saying 400 gig ZR, that's not a specific thing. There's 400 gig ZR in a CFP2, 400 gig ZR plus in a, a QSF PDD, and those are two completely different types of technologies that have different types of functionality. So 400 gig ZR plus in a CFP2, that'll largely replace the existing CFP2 200 gig. technologies as network operators want to upgrade but in a qsf pdd form factor that has substantially less functionality uh and won't be used as prominently in these more complex networks uh uh like in metro networks with multiple cascaded roads and things like that so and and and, and amita if, if i may add one more um uh, relevant factor to be taken into account is there used to be a notion that embedded went into transport platforms and transport platforms were this very complex boxes large boxes with switching and everything else uh, that's not true uh, our uh, gx platforms that uh, we are uh, we, we have talked about uh, are engineered to bring the efficiency of a data center type approach in pizza box forms into the transport platforms and so you now have really efficient transport platforms uh, that can take both pluggables and embedded and therefore when you start looking at the engine you simply look at it and say do i want to put, take a pluggable and then start worrying about the optical uh, about the uh, rest of the functionality add additional cards or do i want to take them all in embedded 
And so, as I said, you really have to look at the reach capacity. You have to look at the functionality that you're trying to drive. And there will be places where pluggables will have a value. There'll be places that plug uh, that embedded will have a value and it's, it's a continuum. And, and I truly believe that they will all be solved uh, with these new efficient compact model, model of platforms. Hey, hey, Bill, I think it's also important just to remind people of kind of the, the market size. I know we presented in one of the slides, might have, people might have forgotten, but just how we see kind of the ZR, ZR plus opportunity developing over the next five years. Because I think that also contextualizes right. this whole notion of, you know, how big Right, right. And, you know, yeah, we, we talked about that, uh, I think it was on slide 14 or so. And, and you know, Rob's point and, and Parthi's point about the current embedded pluggables um, showing up there. And you can, you know, on that slide, we showed a decrease, you know, as those um, go down. Uh, and as ZR and ZR Plus pick up, you know, we do expect the adoption of, you know, ZR to, to be in the, you know, uh, four to six hundred million dollar range over, you know, four um years plus or so. Uh, and then, uh, you know, pro probably predominantly from the ICP's initial take up, because that is the case, the short reach, the, the back to this uh, reach um, metric uh, and applications that yes, you can plug in the, the ZR pluggables in, in the routers. And that's probably a sweet spot for initially for deployment in ICPs, less so as you move towards carriers and the more complex metro networks with Rotoms, exactly what we've been speaking to. And in that case, as you look at ZR plus, uh, you know, our assumption is that it will be deployed within optical products. And, you know, that, that market, um, you know, is, is probably grows in that, you know, a little bit lower, uh, maybe two to four hundred million dollar range in that same time period. You know, the sum of those are maybe nine hundred million in, in the two thousand twenty five time period, and that's what we modeled for this discussion. And I deliberately asked you that because it's a perfect segue for the next question. And maybe for actually, I'm not sure who is best suited, either Party, Glenn, or Rob, either one of you. Uh, the question is: There are no industry standards for ZR plus. Does that matter to customers? Question. And wouldn't that, by definition, mean that the market can't be particularly big for ZR plus? So maybe the question of there are no standards and do customers care? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go for it. I, I'll take a crack at the, at the standards, and and uh, you know, absolutely, that that brings to the point. Uh, and and I, I had a quote there uh, by Dave Welch, our co-founder. Uh, you you try to standardize and you try to make this plug and play, you lose all the cost. Uh, advantages that innovation brings. And all I need to do is remind people that there was something called Starcase, FEC, and standardization in 100 gig QPSK. Uh, and, and pretty much it went nowhere. You know, 16Quam came along, dropped the cost by half, and, and we all moved over. And even in, in, in ZR Plus, uh, that you take a look at today, even though it's called Open ZR Plus, so on, uh, everybody will talk about. Uh, you have 400 to 600 kilometer, 400 gigabits per second interoperable. But then operationally, they advise their own customers, oh, no, 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 you need to look at my proprietary extensions. You need to look at dropping down capacity. Oh, you can go to 200 gig and go 2,000 kilometers while we are offering them 700 kilometers trans-Atlantic, uh, right? So uh, st standardization uh, has its value. Uh, but we, we strongly believe that innovation will continue to drive. Uh, uh, you know, we, we should differentiate between uh, open interfaces at the programming and management level versus open interfaces at the optical level. We strongly believe that open interfaces at the programming level, that's a must too, because everybody wants to have the fastest integration into their management cycle but open integration into the optical level and trying to attract uh, or, or attempt uh, mid-span meets. Uh, that's a holy grail we've been going after for oh, practically all my professional life. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you have to look at what a standardization mean and, and what are different ways to do it. What do network operators really want? They wanna not be locked into a single vendor, right? That's one of their primary objectives. So you've got all these ports on your devices, CFP2s or QSFPDDs, whatever they're, they want to make sure they can plug any vendor's transceiver, any vendor's pluggable into their device. So from that perspective, standardization on the form factor, how these things plug into their device so they can easily swap between different vendors, um, that's really important. Now, when I'm then turning up a wavelength across a fiber, 
the ability to put one vendor's transceiver on one side and another vendor's transceiver on another side, that has extremely little value, I think. Uh, and we hear that from network operators. They want, yes, this wavelength can be one vendor, the next one can be a different vendor, and the next one can be a different vendor. That has value because it eliminates vendor lock-in. But the ability to put one vendor on one side, a different vendor on the other side, that has relatively small value. And in order to make that happen, as Parthi just mentioned, you have to come down to what I call the least common denominator functionality. To get two different vendors to work together, they will have less performance. And you see this from literally every vendor coming out with a ZR Plus technology. They have the multi-vendor interoperable version, and then they have the proprietary version where it's bookended, uh, but it has significantly better performance. And you know, to use the car analogy, I don't know any network operator that will buy a car that has five gears, but is willing to operate it in a fourth one less efficient gear uh, just to uh, give them the opportunity to interoperate. If the uh, vehicle has a fifth gear that'll give them better value, they will use it. Uh, and right now, proprietary bookended solutions will uh, clearly have better performance, provide greater value, while still eliminating vendor lock-in by enabling them to turn each wavelength up as a different vendor. So I don't see um, multi-vendor interoperable transceivers as particularly significant. None of the network operators I talk to say that it is. Uh, they really want the best value. They want to be able to switch vendors when necessary or when it makes sense, uh, both for economic reasons as well as to enable them to get access to the latest technologies. But they always want to get the most value out of every piece of equipment that they buy. Uh, and that'll be these uh, more proprietary uh, transmission methodologies uh, that require bookended, uh, but give them greater value, more capacity per laser, greater reach, greater uh, capacity per fiber, things like that. Uh, so we have about five minutes. Uh, two other questions uh, came in on XR. Uh, can you broaden the discussion to XR? How does that play into your portfolio strategy? Uh, the other one is, does XR uh, mainly affect DCI or can it be extended to Metro? So candidly, you know, we had started to introduce the topic of XR. We felt it was just too much we were packing into this conversation. So if I could just ask you to be a little patient, we do plan to get into a little more of a detailed conversation with XR, but maybe at a high level, if somebody just wants to take the question of what are we trying to achieve with XR, just at a high level, and then we'll defer the details to a subsequent conversation. Yeah, I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to go back to, when we talk about the value of vertical integration, and, and I thought that third box was the most important. This is a, a really what I think is a, a profound, but very significant statement um, made by Dave Welch, our founder, which is what really drives value in a network is innovation. It's great to commoditize and it's great to just build the next generation of what you've done last generation. But if you look across the history of the industry, what has really driven uh, stepwise improvements in value is innovation, whether that's the introduction of rodents or the introduction of coherent or the introduction of EDFA amplifiers. These are the things that fundamentally change the way you can build networks, dramatically lower costs and enable new types of functionality. This has been kind of a hallmark of Infinera since the beginning. Uh, we've been constantly pioneering innovative new technologies, whether it's photonic integrated circuits, whether it's Nyquist subcarrier based transmissions, whether it was the first DCI platform. Um, it's all, all of these things are substantially changed the way network operators can build their networks, not just adding a little bit of capacity or reducing cost per bit by a few percent. XR optics is really kind of that same kind of technology. Um, it's the, and it's, we say XR optics, but really what we're talking about is this point to multi-point coherent optical technology. For all of history and optical networking, you've got symmetrical solutions. I put a hundred gig laser on one end of the fiber, I have to put a hundred gig laser on the other end of the fiber. XR optics and multi-point coherent is the first time we now have a coherent optical technology that's point to multi-point. I can put one 400 gig laser on one end and I can have that simultaneously talking to numerous lower speed lasers on the other end. Why this is so substantial is if you, you think about the way this works, it's gonna work very similarly to the way radio networks work. How does a mobile network work? Well, you put a big giant radio on a cell tower and that talks to a lot of smaller radios at the edge. Um, and that's a very efficient way to build it. If we built uh, mobile networks the way we built optical networks, you build a mobile network by building a cell tower with a thousand little tiny radios on it, each radio talking to one of the endpoints. Uh, that obviously doesn't make any sense, but yet that's the way we've been building optical networks for, for many, many years. So XR optics and point to multi-point technology really uh, provides a, a pretty significant shift in the way one can build a network. 
And where it makes the most difference is in aggregation networks. It's not, it can be used in DCI. Certainly that's a good application for it. But anywhere you've got lots of endpoints aggregating onto a fewer number of aggregation locations, this is where it can have really, really substantial uh, impact uh, on the overall fundamental nature of, of networks. And you think about where that is in a network, well, it's everywhere pretty much but the core, right? All user services, mobile, residential, business services, data center services, they're all about taking lots of endpoints and trying to aggregate them onto a fewer number of aggregation or you know, data center service service locations. So maybe just to build, maybe just to build, question. That, maybe just to build on that, Rob. Uh, uh, in addition, so we, we see XR as, as uh, uh, a, a particularly clever, particularly flexible technology, because going back to the ZR Plus discussion we just had around the, the way in which, uh, in particular, long-reach pluggables will very likely be uh, deployed, not just in the short term, but in the long term, is in a bookended fashion, meaning uh, that with XR, we have a capability to, to deliver both very high-performance point-to-point uh, links, um, uh, ZR Plus point-to-point uh, uh, -point links, as well as uh, point to multi-point capability. So in one pluggable solution, we can deliver both point to point capability, uh, short reach and long reach, as well as point to multi-point capability. And we think that really gives a, a significant degree of, of flexibility to the operator to use the point to point capability where that's a fit uh, within their access and metro aggregation networks and use the point to point technology where, they, where, where that's a fit in perhaps DCI applications and longer reach point to point, uh, point, -to -point links. Uh, so what we really are trying to do is use innovation to drive down the cost of deployment for a network operator. Um, and it really comes down to fit for purpose. Uh, sometimes the point to point uh, capability applies. Sometimes the point to multi-point capability applies. Uh, and we want to be able to provide both of those solutions. Uh, and then we'll make this the last question. Uh, I, I'm just sensitive to everybody's time. Uh, does the growing complexity of optics at each generational node suggest that there are advantages or disadvantages of tighter integration with routers and or switches? Um, the complexity of the uh, optics uh, is not tied to, uh, uh, is, is more tied to the DSP. So integrating the optics front end and the DSP and, and, and attaching them together, that's the complexity. The attachment between the router and the uh, optical engine, if you will, is one of pure management. Uh, if, you, if you look at the justifications for why something needs to be plugged, uh, plugged into a router, it would be, oh, we can save some cost, but comes with operational issues. Uh, just, I, I, I will give one data point that people should look at. Uh, we've talked about disaggregation. We've talked about allowing multiple vehicles to run on a, on a road. Just look at the complexity people are facing in trying to just take multiple transponders and put them on a line system. That integration, automating that, uh, dealing with protection switching on the optical layer, uh, that's all complexity. Now we want to take all of that and load it on a router. All you're going to do is open up another uh, uh, virtual engine and uh, virtual machine, and you're going to be running all the software that we run on the controller card. So in, 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 a, in a sense, I would say uh, the, the, there is, the, I see no advantage. In fact, I see you are trying to complicate the management task uh, between the two. Uh, and, and one additional point I would say is, there is a notion that uh, uh, pluggables are all of same size and client and line are same size. Now, about three years ago, we had this snapshot in time notion that, oh, everything could fit in a QSFP DD or in a OSFP. But if you really go ask people, are you deploying ZR plus for longer distances in a QSFP DD? No, it's a CFP too. And that is without uh, significant functionality in it and without any of the controls to manage the line system. Uh, so I, I strongly believe, and that's why I said the northbound interface, the management standardization, Absolutely, routers should be able to talk to the transport boxes and do dial on demand bandwidth. That's something we've been talking about for 30 years. Uh, so that, that, that is more important. That integration is more important, not the physical location of the pluggable onto a router. I wanted to make one other comment because it raises a really good point. 
right? Which is what is one of the primary drivers for disaggregation? Why are we trying to separate different types of functionality into different types of platforms? One of the biggest drive, and we see that in optical, trying to separate the line system and the transponders. Why do we do that? Is because each of these different types of technologies have different innovation cycles, different innovation speeds. When you start coupling things together, you bring everything down to the same integration, innovation, integration speeds, you know, uh, innovation cycles. And keeping things separate enables the routers to innovate at their speeds and transport and optical to innovate at its speeds. And it enables you to integrate and introduce new technologies as they come out with each different type of uh, functionality uh, independently. You don't have one technology holding back another technology uh, from an innovation cycle. So keeping different, and we see network operators really pushing for this a lot, right? Keeping different types of technologies that have different innovation cycle speeds independent so that they can always use the best technology at any individual network function. I, 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 you know, one, one last closing thought for me, uh, Amitabh, is that uh, all this disaggregation, so on, is really at the end of it, somebody massively aggregating. And so what do I think is the right optical aggregation onto switches? It's going to be co-packaged optics. And so routers and switches, those chips are going to have co-packaged optics. The moment you go to co-packaged optics, you basically removed all the transport functions from the stuff because the density of the face plates, the capacity, mm -hmm. you're not going to sacrifice that on a router. So yeah. as you get to this, you know, the three-year notion that you could fit everything client and line side is already not valid anymore. And as you get to co-packaged optics, you're not going to be sacrificing density on your router just because you want to save some short reach stuff, which is dropping down to $100 uh, price points. So I think uh, just like in the, uh, uh, in the server business where compute and storage and networking are separating out. In fact, they are trying to take cash away from uh, compute. You're going to see the same thing. You're going to have different best of breed engines uh, and trying to claim that putting them under the same sheet metal is the most effective way. Uh, is uh, I don't see significant technology or operational value. Thank you. Uh, sounds like a great deep dive topic sometime in the near future. <laughs> uh, so with that, with that, I wanted to say thank you to everybody and sincerely to our participants and attendees. You know, while we all love to hear ourselves talk, what makes these sessions fun for us is the Q and A. It's uh, it's great to see your participation and engagement. I know we didn't get to all the questions, but we'll have many more chances to converse. So with that, thank you again and good luck with the earnings season and we'll talk to you all soon.